So welcome back to our Lent series, Famous Last Words of Jesus. We're looking, studying, and, and, and being blessed by the, His words from the cross and what those mean for us. <clears throat> My mom is a piano teacher. And so when we were growing up, as you might imagine, um, we only had to practice piano on the days that we ate. No, serious. Like, she had that sign hanging up in our, in our house. It, it's still there. You only have to practice on the days that you eat. So, yeah, we had to practice piano every single day for an hour. Hour a day. And now here's the thing. If we missed a day, we had to make it up. So if we missed a day, we had two hours the next day. And, yeah, you guessed it. If we, if we missed another day, three hours. So some of, us were, some of us were logging lots of hours of piano um, at some time. So if I'm just going to be honest, if I'm just going to be honest, um, we didn't like practicing piano that much. So one day I didn't. Mom came home and she said, did you practice piano? And I said, yes. I lied. And so she just asked all my other brothers and sisters, did he practice piano? And they all said, no, I got busted lying. So we learned how to cover for each other. Okay, when mom comes home, you say that I practiced. And I'll say the same for you. So we all became liars. But my older brother, he wasn't very good at it. So she came home, and she asked him if he practiced piano, and he said, yes. And she looked at the piano, and she said, um, all your books are exactly in the same place they were when I left. You didn't practice piano. He got busted. So we learned how to move our books around so it looked like we had practiced piano. We became big, fat liars. So I've lied. What does that make me? It makes me a liar. How about you? How many of you have ever told a lie? Raise your hand if you've ever told a lie. If you're not raising your hand right now, you're lying by not raising your hand. So if, you've ever, if we've ever told a lie before, what does that make us? Liars. How many of you have ever stolen something? Raise your hand if you've ever stolen something. A few less hands, that's good, because that means that you're all tithers, right? Because God's Word says that if you're not giving Him the whole percentage that honors Him, you're stealing from Him. So if we've ever stolen something, what does that make us? It starts with a T-H. Thieves. One more. Have you ever put something ahead of God in your life? Raise your hand if you've ever put something ahead of God in your life. If you're not raising your hand, you're putting your pride in, in, ahead of God. So if, if we've ever put something ahead of God in our life, what does that make us? It starts with an I. Idolaters. So to be clear, you are all lying, thieving idolaters. And so am I. Happy Sunday, everybody. Glad you came. So do we deserve to be right with God? No. What does the Bible call us? Because what, what does the Bible say that we deserve because we are lying, thieving, idolaters? It says we deserve death. There's a passage that says the wages of sin is death. So death is what we deserve for being lying, thieving, idolaters. Do you see your need for Jesus? <laughs> Do you see your need for Jesus? We are lying, thieving, lustful, selfish, adulterous, idolaters who deserve death. And our sin, the thing that deserves death, the sin that marks our lives brings guilt into our lives. It brings shame into our lives. Guilt, guilt reminds us what we've done wrong. Shame convinces us that what we've done wrong is who we are. So how, how do you deal with guilt and shame? 
When you've done something you shouldn't do and, and you feel bad about it, how do you deal with that guilt? So many ways, right? And this is a big thing because this, this, this consumes us. How do you deal with your guilt? Do you beat yourself up about it day, day in and day out? Or do you try to just distract yourself from thinking about it so you don't think about it anymore, but then just find that those, those thoughts come rushing right back to your head when you lie down to go to sleep at night? Do you maybe go to town on that carton of uh, ice cream in the freezer <laughs> or something else in the refrigerator? Do you, um, do you just try to do a bunch of good things to, to make up for and balance the scales? How do you deal with guilt? Maybe it's, you know, maybe it's something you did. Maybe it's something you, you keep doing right now. Maybe it's something that was done to you. Maybe, maybe it's that stuff you said behind your friend's back. Maybe it's, um, maybe it's those images you looked at last night. Maybe it's that abortion you had years ago. Maybe it's that something you did behind closed doors. Maybe it's something that happened in your childhood. Maybe it's those kind of dark thoughts you have that you hope no one ever finds out you have. How do you handle guilt? We all need a way to handle guilt. Um, psychologists, philosophers, talk show hosts have been, have been discussing it for years. But there's only one, there is only one answer that will help us handle guilt. And it comes in some famous last words that Jesus spoke from the cross, which we're going to get to. But first, I want to look at um, two different ways um, of handling guilt that, the one, that we saw in our first Bible reading for today, Peter and Judas. Let, let's look at the, way, the two different ways that Peter and Judas handled their guilt. Okay, Both Peter and Judas did something horrible, something terrible. They betrayed their Lord and Savior, Jesus. They both denied him. They both betrayed him. And they both did it after Jesus told them they were going to do it, and then they said they weren't going to do it. So they knew it was wrong, and they were both filled with guilt by it. They were filled with remorse. It it says that about Judas. It says that about Peter. They, They were filled with guilt. They felt terrible about what they had done. But both of them handled their guilt in two very different ways. Peter it says he, he broke down in tears. He went out and wept bitterly. He felt terrible what he'd done. He felt good. He knew it was wrong. He realized he was wrong. He repented. And he returned to Jesus. But Peter trusted in Jesus' love. He ran, but he didn't run away. He trusted. He believed that Jesus could forgive him. He trusted in Jesus' love and forgiveness. And so he returned to Jesus. He repented. Jesus forgave him. Jesus reinstated him. So he felt bad about what he had done, but he trusted Jesus could forgive him. Judas, Judas no longer believed that God could love him. Judas um, did not believe that God could forgive him. He, he thought his sin was too terrible for God to love him. He, he, so he felt horrible. He knew what it was. He knew it was wrong. He knew he had sinned. He said, I've sinned. He felt remorse. He felt bad. He felt terrible. But he, he didn't believe in Jesus as his Savior. He didn't trust that Jesus could forgive him. He was convinced that, that um, what he had done was now who he was. And so he ends up taking his life. He, he, he cuts himself. He doesn't trust in God's grace, and so he cuts himself off from God's grace. His unbelief, not, not, his, not the way he died, his unbelief in God's grace separated himself from God forever. And so how we deal with guilt, how we handle guilt has eternal consequences. Both Peter and Judas did some terrible, they committed terrible sins. They failed miserably. But Judas, Judas thought his sin was too terrible for God to forgive him, too terrible for God to love him. And so he didn't believe in Jesus' forgiveness. He didn't believe in God's love. He didn't believe in grace. And so 
he ended up in hell. He ended up separated from God forever. The Bible pretty strongly shows that in the book of Acts. Peter knew he had failed terrible, felt terrible about what he had done, but Peter trusted in Jesus' love. Peter trusted in Jesus' love. He, 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 he believed in Jesus' forgiveness. He returned. He, he repented. Um, Jesus forgave him. He ended up following Jesus. He went to heaven. So how we handle and deal with guilt and shame has way more than just psychological consequences. It has eternal consequences. The sad thing, the frustrating thing about this is that both of them could have gone to heaven because Jesus died for the sins of all, including Peter and Judas. And so both of them could have had eternal life. Both of them were offered the gift of forgiveness. Both of them were offered the gift of eternal life, but Judas threw his gift away. Now Jesus went to the cross. And we read in Luke 22. It should be Luke 23. Wrong passages up there. The wrong passages up there. So it should be from chapter 23. So Luke 23 says... Two other men, both criminals, were also led out with him to be executed. When they came to the place called the Skull, they crucified him there along with the criminals, one on his right, the other on his left. So who was with Jesus? Two criminals. Okay, these were not good people. These were not good men. These were not good people at all. They were the, they were the lowest in society. The lowest of criminals, because crucifixion, death by crucifixion, was reserved for the lowest of criminals to humiliate them while killing them. And so both of these guys had lived some sort of a life of crime, and and they were getting what they deserved. They were getting justice. And both of them, as Matthew and Mark's gospel points out, both of them started out by insulting Jesus. Okay, but then something changed. Do we have the next verse up there? No. All right. No. All right. I should have left it open. All right. Okay, then something changed. Here's and this is our actual text for the day. One of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at him. Aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself and us. But the other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God, he said, since you are under the same sentence. We are punished justly, for we are getting what our deeds deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus answered him, truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. So both of these guys spent their lives as lying, thieving idolaters, committing crimes. Both of them were caught. Both were declared guilty. Both of them were crucified right next to Jesus. And both of them began the day by mocking Jesus. But then we have number one. Then we have thief number one. And he says, aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself and us. So he's been a criminal his whole life. All right? He's been a criminal his whole life. He's now getting what he deserved, but now he wanted to escape that punishment that he was getting. So maybe he heard that Jesus you know, healed people and that Jesus you know, uh, saved people from dying. So maybe he thought Jesus could save him from dying, that Jesus could save his life. You've heard those kind of prayers, haven't you? God, if you're there, make my life better. Help me out here. God, if if you're there, um, give me this thing. Or help my grandma be free from cancer. Or help me get this promotion. Or help me get this date. Or help me buy this house. Or help me get this raise. 
God, if you're there, help me now. But then after hanging on the cross for a while, there are no signs that Jesus was going to do anything. So he starts mocking Jesus. You call yourself a savior, but I don't see any saving going on here. What's the irony? The irony here is that the only way Jesus was saving them was by staying on the cross. If he had come down off of the cross, he wouldn't have been saving anyone at all. So this man, this thief, number one, sees, he gets to see Jesus die to pay for the sins of the world. But he didn't believe in him. He knew he was a bad man. I don't think he would have denied that. But he rejected the gift of forgiveness and life that was being offered to him, like Judas. Then you have thief number two. And he says, we are punished justly for we are getting what we deserve, but this man has done nothing wrong. So he admits he's done wrong. He, he, he admits his guilt. He admits that his sin deserved death. He knew that his goodness wasn't getting him into heaven. But as he's watching and observing Jesus throughout the course of the day, something starts to change in his thinking. Something starts to change. Jesus seems, in all this, strangely calm. Jesus almost like invites the nails instead of like resisting them like everybody else being crucified. He refuses the, the gall. He refuses that narcotic, basically, th that would have deadened the pain and eased this up for him a little bit. <laughs> and then he asks God to forgive the people who were nailing him to the cross. And then he comforts his own mother instead of crying out to her. And the whole time they're mocking him as a king. Now, if, if he's just crazy, they would just let him go. But, but if you only kill a king, if He's something to fear. You only kill a king if he actually has a kingdom. Could it be? Could it be? Suddenly, this, this, this thief, this criminal, this lying, thieving, idolater criminal um, who had cursed Jesus now speaks up for him. And he says, don't you fear God to the other guy? Don't you fear God? He says, we're, um, we're getting what we deserve. We deserve it. But this man has done nothing wrong. We're guilty. And he's innocent. We're filthy. And he's pure. We're wrong. He's right. You know what? He's not on the cross for his sins. He's on the cross for our sins. The Holy Spirit was working on this man's heart, convicting him of his sin, showing him that Jesus was his Savior. And so the man makes the, pretty much the same request that any believer in Jesus has made. Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And here Jesus performs the greatest miracle, the cross. Greater than the, the three hours of darkness or the earthquake or the rock splitting open or the people coming out of their tombs or even the temple curtain being torn in two. The greatest miracle of the cross is forgiveness. Jesus says, he says, uh, truly I say to you, in other words, it's kind of like, um, I'm telling you the truth here. Today, you will be with me in paradise. Today. Okay? Not tomorrow. Not next month. Not after you complete some probationary period. Not after you pay back all the stuff you've stolen. Not after you complete hundreds of years in purgatory working out your debt. Not after you get baptized. Not after you complete ten lessons of our starting point class. Not after you've gotten your life back together. Today. You, you as in you, lying, thieving, idolater, the thief. Does this not show us God's grace? Do we not see undeserved love here? Um, how, lo how long could this man have been a believer in Jesus before he died? An hour or two? 
And yet after a life full of rottenness, he's going to be with Jesus today. He couldn't do any good works. He couldn't, like, donate money to an organization. He couldn't do a bunch of good anything. He couldn't, he, he, he couldn't, he couldn't like, get a whole new start. He couldn't, you know, stand up and say, uh, from here on out, I will never, or from here on out, I will always. He couldn't do anything. He couldn't even get down off the cross. He could do nothing but trust in the grace of Jesus. So you, and then with me, with me. The, the best, most comforting part of this promise Jesus makes to us is that we will be with him. Now, this criminal um, probably didn't have the best relationships in the world, right? Got to think, right? Um, probably didn't have, like, the perfect family waiting for him at home. He probably spent most of his time hanging out with other criminals. And here, the promise from Jesus is that he was going to get to be with Jesus. The, the best relationship ever. The best companion you could ever have. Now you probably have amazing families and all kinds of wonderful friends that you will look forward to one day being reunited in heaven with. And as great as all of that's going to be, none of that's even going to compare to the fact that you are going to get to see Jesus. <laughs> You're going to be with Him. Can you imagine that first hug as you walk into the presence of God, that first hug with Jesus? <laughs> could last as long as you want. That first hug could last a year if you want. Can you imagine being with Jesus in paradise? Paradise, that word comes from garden. And it reminds us of the first garden, the first paradise in the Bible, the, gar the Garden of Eden. Th this perfect, beautiful garden where, um, where Adam and Eve lived with God. And then in the, in the last chapter of the Bible, in the book of Revelation, it gives us another picture of heaven, also with fruit trees and a river flowing through it, a perfect garden a perfect place where we will get to live with God, where there will be no sin and no guilt and no shame and no crying and no pain. The perfect place we get to live with Jesus forever. <laughs> now you're the thief on the cross, and Jesus speaks these words to you. I mean, these words are quite the comfort to that thief on the cross, aren't they? But they weren't only a comfort to the thief on the cross. These words are a comfort to everyone who ever hears these words. Because when you hear these words, you and I can just think, if he gets to go to the paradise, I do too. Not because we're better than him, but because this shows that it's by grace. It's only by grace. And so if he gets to go to heaven by grace, we get to go to heaven by grace. Jesus removed your guilt so that you could be in the garden with him. I know that, that many of you, you know, struggle with guilt, struggle with shame. It can, it can be a very heavy weight and burden that we, that we carry around in life. But, but this is why Jesus came. Okay, this is why Jesus came. This is why Jesus died on the cross. He died to lift our guilt off us, to lift our shame off us, to, to show us that's not who you are. Here's who you are. Here's who I've made you. Jesus came to lift the weight and the burden of guilt, to, to lift the weight and the burden of sin and the death and the problems that that has caused us out of our life and bring us into paradise, bring us into his garden to be with him. Okay, Jesus was found guilty so that you would be found innocent. Jesus was mocked by the people around him so that you could have the perfect relationship with him. Jesus died the death of a criminal so that you could be set free from that and not, not let that be your identity anymore. Jesus carried the weight of your guilt and shame so that you wouldn't have to. Jesus was hung on a tree so that you could eat from the tree of life. So how do you handle guilt? You could call a psychologist. 
and have them, you know, talk about what happened in your childhood. You could just try covering it up, hiding it with your fake smile. You could binge watch Netflix and just distract yourself from ever thinking about it. You could try doing a bunch of things every single day to try to make up for it. But the only, the only one real and true way to deal with guilt and shame is to listen to the words that Jesus spoke to a lying, thieving idolater. Today, you will be with me in paradise. These words give life. These words give a new identity to us. <laughs> we are no longer lying, thieving idolaters. We are God's perfect, holy, forgiven children who get to look forward to going home with him, who, look, who get to look forward to living in paradise with Jesus forever. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you for lifting us out of our guilt. Thank you for just lifting our hearts to heaven with your words of hope. I, I would just ask that you would be with, with everyone here, that, that you would, as we, as we struggle with guilt, as, we, as the world around us um, beats us down and gets us to fail and, um, and, then, and drags us into thinking that, that you could never love us or that, that what we've done now is just too hard for you to handle, would you remind us of these words that we hear in your scripture today, would you remind us that, that today you have a home for us? That, that you don't see us as thieves and criminals and robbers and liars. That you, that you see us as holy, perfect, forgiven children. R remind us of that new identity and help us live that identity out with the hope we have because of your grace that we don't deserve and with just the joy of knowing where our true home is. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.